Fundamentals of Gnostic Education. Dear friends, good evening and welcome everyone to our pre-chamber lecture series. The lecture that we have tonight is one of the most critical lectures that you will find in the whole curricula of our pre-chamber series. The key to understanding what is necessary for the elimination of the ego is contained within this very material. Many students tend to bypass these lectures because they are not speaking of magic or they are not speaking of astral travel. And what they fail to realize is that the concepts that exist in this lecture are the same concepts that are concepts that are reviewed in the second and in the third chambers of the study. That means in the most advanced levels. So let's take a look at fundamentals of Gnostic education. To do this, we have to start speaking about the concept of free initiative. We all believe that we have this free initiative available to us. But in reality, people today in general are living in a lull. People go to work unconscious. They get in their cars and they go from one location to another. And in many instances, they get there and they do not even remember how is it that they got there. People go to work they deal with the problems. They go to school. All of this while unconscious. And particularly, speaking about our young generation, as it's going through school and developing itself, it goes to school unconscious. And at the same time, it is being forced to study some subjects that, in most cases, they do not even understand. These students go through the motions. They rely on their mechanical ability to store all of this information in their mind and they store it in many cases they don't know what exactly they are storing and much less how is it that they can use it the saddest part of it is that many of our students today they just go to school because their parents say you go because i told you to do it you're going because i say so you're going because it is the law because if you don't go i'm gonna go to jail and because there are all of these apparent compelling reasons, students do not stop for a second to think, why is it that I am here? Why is it that I am learning this? How can I put this into use throughout my life? And as a consequence, they go through different struggles throughout their school years. They go through worries, they go through anguish, preoccupation, just so that they can pass an exam just, as they, just, so, just, just so that they can go from one grade onto the next. And the result of this is that they will finish the school year. In many cases, they will finish the school year with flying colors. But they will still not know the real reason behind, why am I studying? Why am I doing this? Let's just combine th this a little bit with the, the specific case of what happens to many young women. Many young girls are led into the ex consideration and the acceptance of fantasies. They are at home and based on the many different experiences that have gone through the home, uh, parents or mothers will tell their daughters, you need to prepare yourself. You need to go to school and get a good education so that you can find a good husband, so that you can have a good partner in life. Many will tell them, you need to make sure that you are capable of learning how to make a living. Because, you know, you never know. Things can always turn against you. And many young women will absorb all of these considerations that will plant some seeds of fear within their own psyche. And they will continue going back to school, living the current situation of the school life that many other students are living. It is, it is a life that is vague. They go through many circumstances that are, for the most part, incoherent. They go through subjects and the understanding of subject matters that is, in many, many cases, so subjective. And it is subjective because people may know it very well for what it is saying in the book, but in reality, they still do not know how to apply it. And because it is vague and incoherent and, and, and subjective, well, sometimes some students will start drifting off. They will not be able to, to maintain good grades. And some parents, those who perhaps are more, 
more, more financially capable, they will even dare to go and offer bribes so that their child can pass. And in some cases, some teachers, based on, on, on their many uh, compelling circumstances and many challenges they're facing in life, maybe the, the difficulties that they're going through, some teachers will accept them. We can conclude that a passing grade is not equivalent to intelligence. The ability to store information in our memory and regurgitate it with eloquency is not an equivalence of intelligence. Just because we remember things does not mean that we can apply them, that we can use them effectively in life. So what is truly important here in the direction that we have to start moving ourselves is that we need to achieve luminous cognizance of what we're studying. The understanding of what we're studying needs to be objective. There has to be an element of experiential knowledge behind it so that we know when is it that it applies? How is it that it works? How is it that we can use it? How is it that we can even get more value from it? If we don't do that and we continue to see many other people going through the schooling system as most of us did, we just go through it, we regurgitate information, we are able to successfully graduate. Then after we go through all of those ordeals and, and so many sour moments, it so happens that, well, they will go through the same thing that many of us have been going through this moment. They will continue to grow and they will marry, they will have children, they will continue to suffer. And we will continue on, on the path of many others in which if we don't do something different, not only we're going to continue suffering, but we will die without a true cognizance of our own lives. In the case of young women, because women play such an important role, not only in society, but in the edification of a true man. Many of these girls with those seeds of fear already implanted in their psyche, they will grow to marry. And they will perhaps even grow to have a home and see their children. And then they will end up arguing with the neighbors. Many of them will go through the lamentable consequence of, uh, consequences of a divorce. And even beyond that, many more of them will just get married again to continue living very painful dramas. So I guess that we can say in terms of the schooling system, our teachers are in the impending need of awakening their consciousness so that they can help students. But allow us to say this, even though Samael Anveor makes a direct reference to teachers in this chapter of fundament, in this chapter in his book of fundamental education, whenever he sees he states teacher, and we hear teachers in this lecture. We have to think that's us. Because we educate others by the quality of our actions. Our actions speak so much louder than words, and it is imperative that we understand that everything that we do constructive will help educate others. And everything that we do that is inferior, that will harm others, well, they're also going to learn it. So in a way, this aspect of teaching belongs to each and every one of us listening to this lecture. So let us say this again. We all must awaken our own consciousness so that we can help those who are surrounding us. It is important that we turn our subconsciousness into consciousness. Those many things that exist below the intellectual regions of the mind, we need to be able to dig in there, bring them out so that we can see them, understand them, comprehend them, and turn that subconsciousness into consciousness. All of our efforts need to go into awakening consciousness and helping others through our own actions learn how to think. Look, as we continue speaking on this subject matter of, of the free initiative, all of us, we have to encourage others to freely disagree and healthily criticize in a constructive manner. 
teachers in a classroom, well, they have to encourage the free disagreement and, uh, and, and the healthily criticism in a way that is constructive. And what Samael is saying here is that we are all responsible for enabling the manifestation of some sort of safe environment where we can share points of view so that we can healthily speak about how is it that this works and how is it that this does not work. And as others share of their experiences, that we can expand our own knowledge and our own wisdom until we create that safe environment, we're going to continue encumbered by fear. And fear must be eliminated. Simply because someone who is fearful, they cannot have free initiative. We have to enable the disagreeing amongst all of us. This used to be so common. Those of you who are in your 60s, in your 50s, perhaps in your 40s, you would remember that as you were younger, it was common to see people speaking and have differences in their points of view. And as they would have that, they would listen to each other. They would challenge each other. And, and disagreements were colloquial and seeking to find a deeper understanding. Lamentably, we continue to degenerate at such, a ha at such a fast pace that today, even depending on the color of the hat that you're wearing, you're immediately stigmatized. You could be the most responsible, honest, loving person, and depending on your political affiliation, people will immediately judge you without even knowing anything about you. And much less would care to listen to whatever you have to say. So we have to set the foundations, the right environment, so that we can see fear eliminated. And when it comes to those who learn of what they see in our actions, teachers, when it comes to you and the dynamic of you in the classroom, teachers need to help students become free of fear. Because when people become free of fear, teacher, when your students are free of fear, you enable spontaneous creative expression. You enable spontaneous pure action. We need of that safe environment to enable that creativity. For as long as creativity does not exist, the only alternative that we have is to live in imitation. Samael says, a fearful child creates attachments to develop a sense of security. On the same token, a husband who is fearful, he creates attachments to his wife and then he thinks that he loves her. A woman who is unsure about her future, who, who feels incapable of doing many things, well, she will create attachments to her husband. And even though her husband may abuse of her physically, emotionally, psychologically, she will hold on to him and she will think that she loves him even more. And that is because fear disguises itself with love. Anyone who is short, low on spiritual values, they will always seek of something outside of them. They will always strive for something external so that they can feel accomplished, they can feel complete. And so they will create psychological dependencies of money. They will create attachments to family members, to their traditions, to what they do every, every, every morning on the 25th of December, to what they do together on the last Thursday of November, to what they do on the 31st of the month of October. They will all have a prescripted list of activities and cooking recipes that they will immediately want to kick into action just so that they can feel contributing, so that they can feel fulfilled. Some I live in says people who are poor internally, they rely on gossip, foolishness, and pleasures to keep themselves alive. Fear moves us into many actions that are illogical. We somehow normalize them and we justify them. But fear moves us into repeating things because it is easier to repeat things than the ego to feel itself 
threatened because of its inability to originate. A man, says Samael, who is unable to originate, senselessly repeats traditions of race, of family, and nation. And this repeating, we doing what our grandmother did every Thanksgiving dinner, or we repeating the behavior that we saw from our father when he was dealing with some external stresses or whatever, that is all imitation. And imitation is the outcome of fear. People who are fearful imitate others. And imitation has no limits. People will imitate how others dress, how others walk, how others comb or style their hair. They will imitate the, the use of the same cologne, the same verbal patterns, the same words, the same expressions. And they will seek to do this because in those similarities, remember, this is all equating to affinity, they tend to believe that they are expressing love. After all, the highest affinity, the highest manifestation of love is when you become one with someone else. But the ego has taken this and has deceived us in such a way that it has created its own considerations about these manifestations of affinity. And thus, it imitates. And because the ego, whether in terms of values, it could be negative or positive, well, it will imitate both the good things and, and the inferior things as well. While all of this is happening... While in the psyche, we tend to believe that we are making ourselves better because we are imitating this or that. And we are, every day that goes by, just looking more and more like that one thing that we're imitating. The fact is, is that the more we imitate, the least we create. Imitation destroys the free initiative. Creativity is not imitation. How can we define creativity? Well, if we were speaking about a painting, by imitation, a student would look at a great painter and will try to imitate the brush strokes. We'll try to imitate the color combinations. We'll try to replicate the color palette and use it in a similar way. But that is not creativity. That is simply developing technique. Repeating the technique is just a very mechanical activity. So if anything, we are turning ourselves into robots of flesh and bone. For us to be able to express creativity in this same example of art and painting, you would have to be able to observe and take what you have observed and make it yours. You would have to contemplate a nightfall and receive the impression of that nightfall deep within your being. And as you make that yours, externalize it in such a way that you can transmit all of its abstract beauty in such a way that others can perceive it and, understanding, and understand it. If you are contemplating a rose, you would have to take in the beauty of that rose in such a way that as you take in those impressions and you receive them deep within you, that as you make those impressions of your own experiential knowledge, that you can exteriorize them by transmitting their abstract beauty in a way that others can perceive the majesty of that rose. We have to learn to feel the deep significance of things. But we have to learn to feel that deep significance without fear. We have to understand that it does not matter what others say. As Thomas de Kempis, in his writings, The Imitation of Christ, as he said, it does not matter what others say, regardless of what they say. At the end of the day, I'm still myself. So we have to learn 
to absorb that deep significance without fear of what others may think, what others may say, whether somebody is going to mock us, we're going to get reprimanded. No. When we are able to absorb that deep significance and retransmit it in such a way that others can also understand it and perceive it, that is right there where we see a beautiful expression of creativity. And we need to help teach others how to create. But for us to be able to educate others on how to create, we have to learn to create ourselves. We have to learn to think for ourselves in an independent manner. And teachers in a classroom, we have to take our students and we have to educate them in such a way that they can learn to think for themselves in a way that is also independent. We cannot keep telling them what to think, but how to think. And we have the responsibility of giving all of the possibilities so that others can find an opportunity to not live as if they were robots. If we are in a classroom and we are teachers, then we have to make the effort of granting all the possibilities so that we can teach how to not live as an automaton. If we don't do this, then everyone around us is going to also continue to live afraid of life. They're also going to continue to imitate, to repeat the same patterns that their family has lived, to continue repeating the same traditions, many activities that are simply senseless. How often do we not hear the war stories of the Thanksgiving dinner? On how is it that people come and there's so many family conflicts and dramas, tragedies, lamentations. And even though this happens, people even look forward to the dinner. People look forward to the hours of preparation, to the cleaning in the kitchen. We have to break away and not continue to live afraid of life. We have to learn to live life with no fear of a changing element, at a change in transition exercise that is called death. It is because of our own dependencies, of our own attachments, that we have come to assume that death is such a tragic thing. But when we embrace the teachings of the great Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, when he says we need to learn to love without attachments, if we were to take that to heart, we would not be so concerned about something like death. And we would certainly not be afraid of it. But friends, we have to learn to live without any fear of what other people may say, of live our lives without fear if we are going to lose the job that we have or not. If our spouse is going to stay, are they going to leave? We have to just break with all those fears. And one way for us to do that is by starting to become cognizant of the many imitations that keep us trapped. If we continue to imitate the behavior of our parents, if we continue to imitate the behavior of that teen idol when we were growing up, of that political figure that we for some reason, have endowed with so many attributes, well, we're going to remain trapped. But if, we com if, but if we become cognizant of our own imitations, we can then free ourselves from the imitations themselves, and then we can give an opportunity for a divine aspect that exists in each and every one of us to become fully creative and when we speak of fundamental education, fundamental education is the science of awakening that consciousness. Science because there is an understanding on all of those phenomena that we will experience by virtue of perceiving their causes and their effects.
And slowly but surely we will come to realize that this thing that people refer to as the awakening of the consciousness is not an instantaneous event. It is not something that happens overnight, but rather this is something that is a summation of many ever-expanding experiences and experiences that have taken place throughout this life and of course throughout the many past lives that you have already experienced. Our mind operates as a machine incapable of creating simply because it does not know how to think. When we start developing a superior way of thinking, when we start learning how to think rather than what to think, our mind starts operating different. And as we transition into superior levels of morality, for the sake of this conversation, if we transition into superior levels of being, we will slowly start noticing that there are ever more superior ways of thinking up to the level in which we can disconnect from the logical, intellectual processes of the mind and rely on fundamental capabilities of the consciousness. Where we can embrace intuition as that ability to know the significance and the reason of things without having to be comparing things in the mind. Enjoying of abilities like inspiration that immediately gives us the spiritual reality of what we are experiencing without having to go and look back into our past experiences and compare. Fundamental education will take us and everyone along a path of awakening that consciousness. And the result of that is that the intelligence is going to awaken and we are going to be able to receive true education because the education will stop being a, mem a memorization exercise and would rather become an experience of experiential knowledge. We also have to realize that to one degree or another, we play the role of the authorities. In a classroom, well, the teacher is the principal authority setting order. At home, as the head of household, as the father, as the mother, well, we play the role of authorities. And if we're at work, depending on what our role is, we also exercise some degree of authority. So we must learn that there are two types of these authorities. One is subconscious, and the second one is conscious authority. Conscious authority is superior, and there are very few who have conscious authority. So let's speak about subconscious authority, because for the most part, this is the one that we will be expressing. Samael clearly states, subconscious authority is useless it has filled the world with pain. Subconscious authority is someone, if we can visualize this with a stick, with a whip, cracking it, leading someone to get certain things done. And if they are not of an awakened consciousness, then it is clearly the blind leading the blind, and we know that that cannot turn out well. Subconscious authority is useless because it forces absurdities that we have come to normalize and consider now acceptable and, of course, logical. And we as parents, we all exercise this type of subconscious authority. We do this when we treat our children like garbage, when we think that we are superior than them. When we think that because we have gone through so many experiences and we have not seen them go through the same experiences, that they know nothing, that they have nothing to contribute, and that they should shut their mouth. You see, that is abusive. That is subconscious authority. Teachers do this as well in the way that they will punish some students who make some mistakes and that they would reward others. Because let's face it, there are many students that are rewarded and they are rewarded even though they can be spoiled brats. 
So subconscious authority enslaves us. It chains us. It perpetuates abuses. It certainly causes pain and a lot of suffering. Subconscious authority destroys the creative power of people. Telling them what they should be imitating, telling them what they, what they should copy, telling them what they should do, telling them what they should think, it all leads to the very same consequence. It takes that creative power and it destroys it. And then, because there are so many negative consequences, well, people are subconsciously terrified. And in that fear, well, they don't dare to get out of the mechanical rules. And because they don't dare, and somehow it, it has served them some good purpose a, a few times in their lives, they will take those mechanical rules and then perpetuate them and force them on other people. Dear friends, we need our teachers to be different. We all have to learn to be different. We need real spiritual guides. We need government authorities that they all become self-aware. Because if they are self-aware, if they are operating not through their fears, but through the divine aspect that exists deep within our hearts, that consciousness, that essence, well, then there would be patience. There would be clear understanding of the difficulties of the individual. It would be a lot easier for us to embrace that ancient teaching of the Maya that says, I am you and you are me. And rather than jumping into an immediate judgment and criticism, we would take an opportunity to truly seek to understand, but as we do that, to even create an environment in which the understanding flourishes like a garden of flowers. When we and teachers and spiritual guides and our government authorities and leaders, when, when, when they become self-aware, when we strive to become self-aware, we can start transcending our mistakes. We can start advancing as a humanity in ways that are triumphant. And all of this will take us out of the space of fear, imitation, perpetuating of our suffering, into a space of true freedom, into a space of real self-awareness. But there is always a catch. And the thing here is that being self-aware is very difficult. I mean, you know that being self-aware is difficult because as you look back into your day, it is very challenging to remember all of the thoughts that you had in the day. And every time that we look back in an exercise or retrospection, well, we find gaps in our memory. And the longer those gaps are, well, you can associate that with different degrees of the sleep of the consciousness. I mean, for many people, it is very difficult at times to remember where they left the phone. And then they, came to re they come to realize that the phone is in their hand. That is the, the degree of self-awareness that we have today. It is exceedingly low. There are many students of psychology, many students of the mind, that they try to recondition their mind. And they rely on positive affirmations and, and many other exercises, even to the depths of self-hypnosis and others. And they try to move themselves into a space where they can live alert from moment to moment. The fact that they're trying is simply remarkable. But they try to live alert from moment to moment, and suddenly they fall asleep. And when does that happen? They fall asleep when they're at the stoplight and somebody honks their horn so that they can move on 0.5 seconds after the light changed. And the shock of the horn and the intensity of, is enough for them to forget about themselves and no longer be alert. Self-awareness is lost. They may be practicing self-awareness, but they come across someone they have not seen in a long time, a long lost friend. 
And when they see them, they transport themselves back in time to the last time that they spent time together. Their personality changes, their voice changes, their inflections change, their behavior change. By then, self-awareness is completely forgotten. They go to the store. And as they are bringing the things that they wanted to bring, they realize that they left at home the little list that they so diligently put together. And then the frustration of not having the list is enough for them to forget about themselves. So you see, they try to live alert from moment to moment, but it does not take much for them to also fall deep into the sleep of the consciousness. In the best cases, many of them recover from that and they remember that they were on an exercise of being aware and alert from moment to moment. So they start again. And a few hours later in the day, the same thing happens. Friends, for us to, to maintain this degree of self-awareness, a high degree of self-awareness, we have to know ourselves. And knowing ourselves means that we need to learn to live in some degree of alert novelty. We have to not take things for granted as much as we do and rather embrace things as, we, as if we had not seen them before. When we do that, we don't deprive ourselves of an opportunity to learn something new. For us to know ourselves, we have to be vigilant of our thoughts. But we also have to be vigilant of our emotions. We have to be vigilant of our of the impressions that we are receiving, how the body is even responding to that. But for us to know ourselves best, we have to know that we have an ego. And we have already learned that the ego is many things. It can be one thing, it can be three things, as we have already learned, an aspect that is desires, an aspect that seeks to justify any mistake at the level of the mind, and then also an aspect that is of terrible, terrible ill will. We also know that our ego is lust, and our ego is anger, and greed, and envy. It is also laziness and pride. It is also gluttonous. See, our ego is many, many things. And when we know that we have this ego, we can then seek to understand each and every one of our defects and understand them well in the many different regions of the mind. Because when we have that understanding, we then become empowered to rely on a power superior to the mind to eliminate that. And the more of those inferior aspects we eliminate, well, not only the more we have known ourselves, but the more free we will become. All of these defects, they show up in the intellectual region of the mind. And when that happens, we can see them. And we can see them very easily. You can look back at any given moment, whether today or in the last few days, and you can see those instances in which you are frustrated. It's very easy to see. You can see the instances in which you felt ambitious or you felt defeated. When they appear in the intellectual region, it is easy to perceive them. But the problem is that in the universe, everything is in constant vibration. Nothing is at rest. So they will appear in the intellectual region for a brief moment, and then they will disappear. And if we think that if, because we don't see them, that because we're not perceiving them immediately, they're not there then we are fooling ourselves and we're falling victims to the very same fallacy of the ego. You know that the ego is not there when you're truly looking for it and it doesn't show up. When you put yourself through the test of fire and there's no reaction. And there's no reaction because that actor is not present. And as Samael very well says, if the actor is not there, the play cannot be. So we have to be cognizant that these defects, they will show up and they will fade away. They will disappear, going back into the subconscious regions of the psyche. But when we are working on comprehending the ego, when we are actively looking for it and we comprehend it, well, if we take it 
and we eliminate it when the ego dies, well, we start awakening from our misery. We start awakening from this current state of nothingness, from these circumstances that are so much suffering and pain. So we want you to know that there are three psychological phases that lead us into our conscious existence. The first one is awakening. And that awakening, it happens as you start developing that sense of alert novelty. With that awakening, as you see those defects, you have to work with that fire of Kundalini, that force that is superior to the mind so that you can beg of your own innermost and ask your Divine Mother to bring that thing that you have comprehended to an end. And when that defect dies, because there cannot be a vacuum in creation, there is no such thing as vacuum, well, the defect goes away. It has to be replaced by a virtue. So these three psychological phases, awakening, death, and birth, let's say rebirth, these are the three steps that lead us into an existence that is of an awakened consciousness. When we awaken like that, it is then that we can command others consciously. But beyond that, it is when we can start obeying others consciously. Awakening the consciousness is of tremendous importance. The key here is understanding. The foundation for that understanding to exist, we're going to label it a safe environment. We have to break away with the chains of fear. If we don't break with the chains of fear, we will continue instilling different rigorous methods to try to force ourselves to reach that destination of awakening. And this is what we call discipline. This is what is known generically as discipline. Discipline is just a combination of many rules and boundaries and scoldings and, and resistances. Because the fact is, is that we are taught to resist. Many of you come to these studies with a very good background, a good foundation in religious studies. So you know very well that all religious traditions speak about us being able to resist the temptations of the flesh. At home, well, we had to learn to resist the temptations of laziness. Because many of you, if you were too lazy, well, your mom would be able to get her chancla and just toss it across the room and convey a message that you could not be lazy, you had to help at home. As we left the house and we went to college, those of us who went somewhere else, well, we had to break away with other temptations to either not study or to get late to work. So we were taught to resist. And because this resisting is a combination of following rules and staying within some limits and boundaries and, and taking consequences when you break them, well, that, that concept of discipline brought with it a misconception. And the lie behind it says, the more you resist, the more you're going to understand. We know that that is not true. Because we are too focused on resisting, on making pretend that the thing is not there so that we can force ourselves through and plow through it. The lie says, the more you resist, the freer you will be. We know that is a lie. If that had been true, all of us would be angels because we have resisted so many, we would be angels, and we know that we are not. The truth of the matter is, is that the more we resist, the lower is our level of comprehension. The more we resist, the more we are forcing this, these defects into the subconsciousness. And what is going to happen? They know that if they are within the intellectual region, the consciousness will see them. Whatever awakened consciousness we have today, we'll see them. And they will naturally gravitate back down into those hidden regions of the mind where they are not perceived. So the moment you let your guard down, the defect is going to show up. So how is it that this look? 
Say you resist fornication. So you're making an effort on resisting fornication. What happens with it? It comes back later. The moment that you stop paying attention, it comes back and it will attack you once again. You make an effort to not look at certain images. You make an effort to not do certain things. And you believe that you are being chased. And then you go to sleep at night. You start having erotic dreams. So all the stuff that you did not he that do here in the physical body, now you're doing it within the astral dimension, within the fifth dimension of nature. And you know very well, because we have already gone through these studies in, in astral travel, that what is doing that is that aspect of you, that lunar soul. You resist fornication here, and then you start having nocturnal pollutions. The more you force yourself to resist here, well, the more you're going to be forced later, the more force is going to come against you later into all of those quote-unquote adventures of unrepentant fornicators. What happens with anger? Well, you can resist anger here. You can resist it to the point where you are on the inside like a volcano ready to erupt. But on the outside, you look super cool. You have a smile. Everything is just fine and peachy. So you are making pretend that it has disappeared. But then something little happens, something very trivial. And before you realize you are reacting with thunder and lightning, and the reaction then is not even proportional to the situation. This is what happens when we're resisting anger. What can we say about jealousy? Well, you start resisting jealousy, just like anger, just like lust. It will pretend that it's gone. It will remain deep within the subconscious. And then it's going to show up later and surprise you. And then one day your spouse is out there and they give somebody a smile. The other person smiles back. And now you're wondering what's going on. That right there, that's jealousy. And it doesn't have to be romantic or passional jealousy. It could be political. It could be financial. It could be educational. It could be institutional. It could be uh, at work. So we need to give ourselves freedom to study our defects. That freedom means not that you're just going to throw yourself into fornication and as you're fornicating, lie to yourself saying, oh, I'm using this moment just to observe how my defect is using my mind because that would be ridiculous. That would be justifying all of our delinquencies. So certainly not that. Freedom means that we need to empower the consciousness to assume a position in which it can contemplate. You need to be able to steal the fire away from that temptation. There is no doubt about that. But you cannot do that mechanically. You have to do it because you need to understand that there is a fundamental principle of humanity that says, do no harm. And you don't want to harm the people you love. So even though you feel angry, you're not going to let that anger just go out and seek, just create chaos because you're seeking to not hurt the people you love. When it comes to fornication, well, that means that you're not going to hurt yourself, hurt others, hurt your family, hurt your responsibilities, hurt many other things that are truly important that would satisfy those things that you need, like home and food and clothing. So because you understand that you're not going to allow that harm unto others, you know that you don't, you're just not going to do that. And it is one thing to understand that concept of ahimsa, do no harm. When you do that, you're being truly humanistic. One thing is to fight against yourself so that the ego does not show up. And another one is to steal the fire away from the ego because you know that you have power over it. Because that consciousness can take away that stolen fire from the ego and just bring it back onto itself. And for that, we have to remain calm. That requires us to be relaxed. 
It requires a consciousness to contemplate and observe and to see many things at the same time. What is happening in your mind? What is happening in your heart? What is happening within your body? And when you can see that, you can understand those defects really fast. And when you're really committed to not hurting others, then you do not give an inch to your anger. When you're committed on not hurting others, you don't give an inch to your jealousies because jealousy destroys love. When you truly seek to not create harm, you don't give yourself to fornication and you don't, don't give yourself to, to someone else be using your body as an instrument of pleasure and much less to you to be connecting with many others and using their bodies as if they were instruments of pressure, of pleasure. Because these bodies are not meant for that. These bodies are meant to become a vehicle of transformation so that we can work with our own creative energies. So let us tell you this, if you are conditioned under fear, all of that conditioning that comes with fear leads us to a sense of no freedom. If you're conditioned under fear, you have to be aware that you are subconsciously frightening of, frightened, frightened of certain things. And because of that fear, you will behave in ways that are erratic. If you're conditioned under this thing called fear, you're going to be imprisoned by all of these rigorous disciplines to get things done. And as a consequence, you will never know your defect. If you are conditioned by fear, you cannot be free. So we have to break from this. We need to become sensitive and humanistic. And the key behind that is do no harm. From that posture, conscious attention leads us into safeguarding, preserving our creative energies. Everywhere we direct our attention, we are burning of our creative energy. If we are more explicit, everywhere where we focus our attention, we are burning of our sexual creative energy. So that is telling us that our attention needs to be wisely directed. We need to take of these energies and safeguard them so that we can have these energies available for this type of spiritual practice. So how is it that we do not misdirect our attention? Well, we have to understand that the moment that we identify in a matter of a split second, we will become fascinated with the thing that we identify with. It could be a beer. It could be the body of someone else. It could be some luxurious object. It doesn't matter. If we identify with it, we will fascinate. And the consequence of fascination is that before we realize, we will be even deeper into the sleep of consciousness. So if you do not want to misdirect your attention, then we cannot identify. And yeah, that is very easy when we say it, but how is it that we put that into practice? Friends, for us to manage and direct our attention, we have to take our attention and split it into three vectors. That means take your attention and you focus it in three different aspects with three different intensities at the same time. And we're going to focus our attention in the subject. The subject is you. See yourself, that envelope of all those things that you are, the body, the consciousness, the personality. You are also the body, the spirit. You're also that ego. So you have to focus the attention of the sub on the subject. And that is easy to do because as a subject, you have sensors. That means you have means to perceive things from the environment. That is why you have your senses. So you have sight and you have hearing, you have the sense of smell, of taste, and of course you have the sense of touch. So anything that is coming to you, to those of you who have your five senses, that's great. And for those of you who have only a handful of those five senses, that is also great. You focus on what is it that you are perceiving 
subject is that thing that is perceiving what is seeing, what it is hearing, what it is smelling, tasting, or sensing at the level of touch. We focus on what is being perceived. What is the instrument of that perception? That is you. And the key behind that is that there is a consciousness in there. The second one, it goes directly to the object. What is being perceived? That is the sensation itself. It could be an image of someone with a beautiful body. It could be a bottle of wine. It could be a beautiful car. It could be a nice landscape. Whatever it is that you are perceiving, that is the object. So one thing is the thing that perceives, and another one is what is being perceived. And it is important that we see that. Because the moment that you can have a third of your attention within that consciousness that is there, perceiving... Number two, the thing that is being perceived, you also have to ask yourself, where am I? Am I in my physical body or am I in a dream? Am I in the astral plane? And let me tell you this. If you start doing this and you can do only one or two minutes a day, that is amazing. Because if this week you can do two or three minutes a day, by the end of the week you have accumulated a little more than 20 minutes. And that is way more than what you have been accumulating in the last 20 or 30 years of life. And the more you do this, you start growing that ability to perceive at the level of the subject, <laughs> the things that you are perceiving through your senses, asking yourself, where are you? Before you realize you're going to be doing this for several hours a week, for several days a week, eventually you're going to be doing this every day. And you will see that this does not take any substantial effort other than empowering the consciousness. The more you do this, the least you identify. The object reminds you that there is a consciousness here that is going through an experience and that the job of this consciousness is to acquire these experiences so that it can help fabricate some superior vehicle so that the spirit can manifest in its plenitude. That is amazing. The moment that you can see that, suddenly the object that you are perceiving no longer has that much importance or value. You see the beautiful body of that person and you realize, yeah, that body is beautiful now, but in a few years, that body's not going to look like that. All that is going to go away. You see the beautiful car. Wow, look at that. And suddenly you realize, I wonder how much maintenance that's going to require. I wonder how much that's going to cost. Suddenly all that loses that enchantment in a split second. You see the bottle of wine. You start realizing how miserable you have been many times after you have woken up with a hangover. The harm that that has brought to you and others. Concept of no harm. And you say, yeah, maybe we don't have to do that. And then you don't identify then you do not fascinate. And as you do that, you don't fall into the sleep of consciousness. We would like to close our lecture tonight with the words of Master Samael Onveor. And he says, All the mistakes that the human being commits in life are because he forgets himself, identifies himself, is fascinated, and falls to sleep. Dear friends, this has been our lecture on fundamentals Gnostic education. Thank you all so much for being here with us this evening, and may all beings be happy.